Drunk Spirits, Frogs and Nudity. It's a Night of the Livy Dead episode all about the Greek underworld on the Ancient History Hound podcast. Hi, my name's Neil and welcome to the Ancient History Hound podcast. For long-time listeners, Halloween means one thing, another instalment of the Night of the Livy Dead series. Over the years, I've talked about werewolves, vampires, demons, ghosts and exorcism in ancient Greece, Rome and even Mesopotamia. This year, though, I thought it's the turn of the Greek underworld. And in this episode, I'll be trying to unravel how the underworld was described and perhaps envisioned in the archaic and classical periods in ancient Greece. Central to this was the journey there, something called the catapasis. The ancient Greeks didn't shape their understanding and expectation of the underworld in isolation. So I'll also bring in a couple of other myths and descriptions from cultures which predated the Greek accounts. And as you'll hear, there are some interesting similarities and parallels. As ever, you can find me on Twitter at Hound Ancient, that's for the podcast, and at Ancient Blogger for me. Episode notes with a transcription will go on ancientblogger.com, along with the sources I've used, and I would doubly recommend you visit, if nothing else, to check out my pumpkins. That's not a euphemism, by the way. For several years, I've been carving Greek vase pumpkins and even a couple of Roman mosaic ones. I'll dare say I'll stick them on Twitter and also on my Instagram, which is, well, you guessed it, Ancient Blogger. And why the heck not while I'm on here? I'm also on TikTok where I am Ancient Blogger. Yeah, you know, that thing about old dogs learning new tricks. When the topic is the underworld and you're talking about the ancient Greeks, there is one account which is always referenced. And I'm going to start with it. In Homer's poem, The Odyssey, the hero Odysseus is tasked to visit the underworld. And as you'll hear, this is no mean feat. It starts when Odysseus appeals to Circe to let him leave. Both he and his men have decamped on her island for some time now, but Odysseus wants to move on and get back home. Circe hears his request and agrees, but she has a detour to Odysseus's plans, and I quote, You have to make another journey and find your way to the halls of Hades and dread Persephone, to consult the spirit of Tiresias, the blind Theban prophet. End quote. Odysseus is terrified by this proposition. He weeps for some time and confesses that he has no further use for life. It's only a few lines, but the sense you get is abject desperation. And this is important because, pun intended, it's a really grave situation he's now in. This isn't a journey anyone wants to make. And in an epic poem where challenges and tests are aplenty, this is one of the most severe. When Odysseus recovers, he asks Circe exactly how this can be achieved, and the goddess explains it all. Firstly, there's a journey to undertake and then a complex ritual to perform. This itself is worth noting. The fact that Odysseus, a character known for his wisdom, is in the dark on this suggests what follows is both secret knowledge and, or, a ritual not known to the Greeks. It wasn't something within the Greek cultural understanding. Again, that's just a suggestion, but it does link in with something about the ritual I get to later on in the episode. Odysseus follows Circe's advice. He boards his ship and sails to a distant shore. Upon arriving, he travels inland to a pinnacle of rock described by Circe. And once there, Odysseus performs a ritual known as a nekia. This was done so he could communicate with the dead. It's how he'll get to question Tiresias, but as you'll hear, it leads to much more than that. It started with the digging of a trench, the width and length of a man's forearm. Into this, Odysseus poured honey, milk and sprinkled barley. Next, there was an invocation to the dead. Then came the sacrifices. In this case, black sheep who had their throats cut over the trench so the blood could pour into it. At this point, there seems to be a sense of danger as the spirits of the dead appear and started to make for the blood. Odysseus keeps them at bay with his sword in hand, whilst his colleagues perform a separate sacrifice to Persephone and Hades. And there seems to be two functions operating here in tandem, the nekia to communicate with the dead and sacrifices and invocations to the dead and the deities to ensure that Odysseus and his men are kept safe. When Tiresias appears, Odysseus allows him to drink the blood and the two converse. Odysseus now has the information he needs to carry on. However, this isn't it. Rather than embarking on the next stage of his journey, Odysseus embarks on a spree of networking with the famous and infamous amongst the dead. In fact, prior to speaking with Tiresias, he even chatted with his mother. It's a really poignant scene as he attempted to embrace her in vain, but instead grasps empty air. 
Much of Odysseus' discussions with the dead involves the linking in with other myths, and it's fascinating purely from this standpoint. However, for the purposes of this episode, the chat he has with Achilles gives us an interesting perspective on the underworld. Achilles bemoans his lot in the underworld. He comments that he'd rather be a lowly farm worker in the world of the living than a king of the dead. And this is really quite something, because in the Iliad he famously made the decision to kill Hector, an act which he knew would bring about his death. He even gets reminded about it by a talking horse. It's the choice between a short and glorious life and a longer but less glorious one. Having made his choice, Achilles seems to be displaying buyer's remorse on quite a grand scale. Finally, Odysseus' encounter with the dead offers some literal insight. He sees a lot, not just mythological characters, but what they're doing. There's Tantalus and Sisyphus receiving their respective punishments, and even King Minos acting as judge. As you'll hear, the concept of judgment was an important one in the underworld. Though it's not given a five-star rating, the underworld wasn't entirely unpleasant, at least not in this account. Odysseus saw the pleasant meadow of Asphodel, which by its own description seems a nice place to end up. Earlier in the Odyssey, Menelaus was told that when he died, he'd end up in the Elysian fields. Very nice indeed, but it isn't clear from Homer if these were located in the underworld specifically. Another poet of the archaic period, Hesiod, also described the underworld with some additional information. In the underworld, you'd find the great pit of Tartarus, which held the titans who'd rebelled against the Olympian gods. It was where the home of Night, Thanatos and Hypnos were found. Hades and Persephone also had their halls here, which was guarded by Cerberus. None of this is couched, though, in particularly pleasant terms. It's gloomy, dark, and the characters are often described as awful or terrible. And yet there is a silver lining. The islands of the blessed, for example, which are reserved for heroes and those who are qualified for a better existence. Both Hesiod and Homer give us a general description of the underworld with which we can form a basic overview. It's not a single place, but one with separate areas or regions. There's also the concept of judgment linking into where you might end up. That said, when Menelaus is told he'd be afforded the Elysian fields, it's done with the rationale that this is because he married Helen and so was a son-in-law of Zeus. In this case, it's not what you've done, but who you knew. The accounts give us some familiar names, such as Hades and Persephone. Cerberus, everyone's favourite hellhound, is given a mention but only named specifically by Hesiod. When Homer mentions him, he's referred to as the Hound of Hades. Hesiod also described him as having 50 heads. In antiquity, the three-headed Cerberus was just one option. We also hear from Hesiod how Cerberus was a big softy, that is, if you were going through the gates of the underworld. Try to go back through the gates and you'd witness his more terrifying side. And this aspect underlines how the journey to the underworld was a one-way affair, and I'll certainly be picking up on that later. King Minos is spied by Odysseus acting as a judge, but another judge is named, Radamanthus. Both of these were sons of Zeus and noted for their wisdom. Another judge is mentioned in the classical period, which I'll get to later. And from judgment we get the segregation in the underworld, the pit of Tartarus, meadows of Asphodel and Elysian fields. Perhaps, as with Menelaus, not all areas were possible for your average deceased, but you might end up somewhere not entirely unpleasant. Homer and Hesiod also mention that famous underworld feature, the River Styx. In fact, water plays an important role in the underworld. It was often a feature to be crossed, whether it was the large sea that Odysseus initially had to navigate, the Styx, or the other rivers such as Acheron, which are mentioned. Given the importance of water and the presence of the Styx, the absence of Charon, the ferryman of the dead, is a surprise. Neither Homer or Hesiod refer to him in any way, but one other archaic poem did feature him. This was the Minyas, thought to have been composed in the 6th century BC, and so later than Homer and Hesiod. But we don't have the poem. We know of it and the inclusion of Charon from a reference which the later Greek writer Pausanias made. Perhaps Charon was a figure yet to be fully ensconced in the Greek underworld. He certainly became a popular figure, not just in Greece. In later Etruscan art, Charon, or Charon, spelt with a U, is depicted on two walls, sometimes with blue skin and a hammer. He still kept a similar role as someone connected with the dead, but not so much as a ferryman. There was another character associated with the dead who's mentioned later in the Odyssey, and not only makes a journey to the underworld, but leads a group of spirits there. One of the manifestations of Hermes was Hermes Psychopompus, the conductor or guide of the dead. It might seem odd, but Hermes was a god associated with liminality, that is to say the in-between places. In this case, between the world of the living 
and the dead. Much of the Odyssey ends when Odysseus visits his revenge on the suitors, but there's much more to the story. I won't get into it here, but let's just say that Odysseus behaves in an increasingly erratic manner once he's back home. In any case, back to Hermes. After Odysseus has avenged himself and slain the suitors, Hermes appeared and summoned their spirits. They follow him, squeaking like bats, which is a wonderful but curious description, and arrive in the underworld, specifically in the meadow of Asphodel. Here the suitors witness an engaging conversation. They hear Achilles and Agamemnon, the latter even pausing to speak to one of them. The spirit of one of the suitors, Amphimedon, informs Agamemnon how they ended up in the underworld, even justifying to an extent Odysseus's revenge. But he also makes a comment which is worth considering. He describes how their bodies are still lying in the palace unmourned. This might seem insignificant, merely Amphimedon adding to the tragedy of it all, and neatly giving a time scale to his interaction. But there may be a problem here. You see, in Greek culture, few things were more important than burial rites. Indeed, in the Iliad, the spirit of Patroclus even appeared to Achilles to ask him to get a move on and proceed with his funeral. The reason? Well, as the spirit of Patroclus pointed out to Achilles, without the correct burial rites, his spirit cannot fully enter the underworld. But here, we have the suitors in exactly that place, or seeming to be. Perhaps the meadow of Asphodel was a sort of waiting room or had that facility to it. Perhaps, though, there's a simpler answer. It's that I'm looking for something which wasn't there. The Odyssey and Iliad weren't theological texts outlining the religious framework of their day. They absolutely reference the central values which we might categorise as religious in the modern sense, but they were primarily poems. The intention was to tell a story to entertain and not deal with eschatological technicalities. Perhaps this contradiction results from this, the change because each worked better in their story. In the case of the suitors, we have Odysseus' revenge being discussed and not criticised, giving it validation. It's also a nice contrast as one of the responses is from Agamemnon, a character killed once he returned home. Actually, in the Odyssey, it's all he pretty much goes on about. As for Patroclus complaining about his lack of full burial, well, it gives the character of Achilles more depth. He's so broken by the death of Patroclus that he simply can't let go. The overarching lesson here is that different poems and poets seem to have dealt with the underworld in a more thematic sense than anything else. And in a way, this makes sense. In the modern age, we are far more tuned to mapping everything out and aligning every detail, even retrospectively. Just listen for the internet howls if someone makes a film in a franchise and it doesn't all line up perfectly. In the classical period, the Greeks took the underworld and considered it further, and this goes somewhere you might not expect, to the realm of comedy and the stage. In 405 BC, the Athenian comic playwright Aristophanes wrote The Frogs. It's a brilliant play in which the god Dionysus embarks on a catapesis. The rationale for this is to bring up a deceased poet as he's fed up with a current dearth of talent. The comic techniques used included farce, visual gags, in-jokes, and what you might expect, but at the heart of it, there's a parody of the catabasis, and that's why it's such an important source in this context. I'll get to the parody element later, but first, here's a brief overview of the play and how the underworld was presented in it. To begin with, the character of Dionysus has relevance in the underworld. There's even a myth where he had his own catabasis in order to fetch back his mortal mother. As often with the Greek pantheon, a deity has associations in areas you might not suspect, and Dionysus was one of those deities who certainly had links with the underworld. And at the end of the podcast, I talk about a festival where, well, you'll hear. The catabasis in the play contains elements we might be familiar with, but also gives artistic license to a character who hasn't yet featured in our surviving works. When Dionysus and his mortal slave arrive in the underworld and reach a marsh, the figure of Charon appears. There's a suggestion in the play he'd have appeared on a boat with wheels, and when reading Greek comedy, it's easy to forget just how much humour resided in the visual and physical gags. It's in this play that we get the reference to the feet of two obols in order to cross on Charon's ferry. That's where we get it from. As he journeys across the marsh with Charon, Dionysus gets into an argument with some singing frogs. Yeah, you, you heard that right. It's why the title of the play is The Frogs. It's plausible that the chorus actually would have dressed up as frogs whilst they danced and sang. That's Greek comedy for you. Or certainly Aristophanes. It's not all cheery, though. On the other side of the marsh, the landscape shifts into darkness and shadows. Here, Dionysus and his slave encounter an impusa. This was a monster which could change form and had one leg of brass. 
That's not a comic thing, by the way. That apparently was a genuine feature of the Impusa. What's notable here is that Impusa wasn't tied to the Greek underworld. Like many monsters of Greek myth, it featured above ground as much as under it. The final element of the frogs I want to mention is what the pair encountered next, initiates. These are a group of individuals singing, dancing and playing music. They mention that they're on their way to the meadow, and we assume that that's a reference to the meadow of Asphodel. At the very least, it carries on that theme touched upon earlier, that the underworld was formed of different areas. The initiates linked into a substantial and religious phenomena in the world of the living. Near to Athens sat the sanctuary of Demeter at Eleusis, and it was here that an annual procession was made, which concluded in a series of rites known as the Eleusinian Mysteries. Exactly what the concluding rites were, we don't know. It was fundamental that any initiate kept them a secret. But here we have something which many of the audience watching this play may have been a part of. In previous references to the underworld, we had a sense that the life you lived affected your afterlife, and this is extended into the area of worship. And to take these rites, become an initiate, and you might be rewarded. What runs through the frogs, though, is the journey, the catabasis, and it's this which is parodied. Elements such as the brave hero, the wise guide, and judgment are either inverted or given the comic treatment. Of course, parodies only work if you use a commonly accepted thing to parody. In short, if they're able to sit in an audience and laugh at a parody of a catabasis, they were probably quite familiar with what one was. And it turns out this is probably true, because though the parody here survives, we know of other comedies which didn't survive, but also used the catabasis as a setup. For example, Eupolis's play Demoi, or The Deans. This involved a reverse catabasis, wherein five famous names from Greek history, such as Solon, were chosen to travel to Athens. A more conventional catabasis, if you can call it that, featured in Ferocrates' play, The Miners. In this case, a woman described the underworld after a visit as a place of luxury and abundance. There was even a lost drama written by Euripides, named after someone I'll be mentioning shortly, which had the catabasis as its central plot. The catabasis was something kept in the Greek imagination, and it was a backdrop for a couple of myths I'll talk about now. I'll start with Heracles. One of his labours involved going to the underworld and bringing back Cerberus. This is a myth referenced in both Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and it comes with a caveat that in each, the name Cerberus is absent. As I mentioned earlier, it was Hesiod who named him specifically. This feat can be seen as a trial of strength, and to an extent, determination, but I prefer to consider it more in the context of bravery. Cerberus, or the Hound of Hades, is normally described in the context of being fearsome, and I think this is the real test here. Both the journey down to the underworld and the idea of dognapping was a test of Heracles' bravery in the way that the other labours weren't, at least not to the extreme here. This can also be seen in part through the parody of this virtue in the frogs. Here, the character of Dionysus is, well, pretty much opposite. He's played as a character more akin to Shaggy from Scooby-Doo than any real hero. The catabasis of Heracles in his labours is one of successfully overcoming a test. But what happened when it went wrong? Well, we have the case of Pirithous to think about that. Pirithous was a mythical figure, a friend of Theseus, who decided that he wanted Persephone, and therefore his catabasis was an abduction, but this time to take Persephone out of the underworld, and he's joined in this quest by his friend, Theseus. But the two come unstuck, or rather, they're unable to come unstuck. When the pair sit on a couple of stone seats in the underworld, they can't get back up. Theseus is rescued by Heracles, but as for Perithous, well, he stayed on the chair. This myth formed the story of that lost play by Euripides I mentioned moments earlier. We don't have a great deal of detail about it, but one tantalising argument is that Perithous was further punished by being fed to Cerberus. Finally, there was Orpheus. This is possibly one of the most famous myths for antiquity. Orpheus loses his wife Eurydice to a snake bite and descended to the underworld in order to win her back. There, he showcases his skills as a musician to such an extent that he's permitted to leave with her on the condition that on the journey back, he doesn't turn around to look at her. Unfortunately, he does, and as a result, she's lost to him forever. On a side note, this myth is a great example of how we can fall into a trap of thinking myths as one coherent thing. Let me explain. Neither Homer or Hesiod mention Orpheus or this myth. In fact, it's not till the 5th century BC when the myth is referenced at all in literature, and even then it's just that, a reference. 
The first time Orpheus's wife is named isn't till a poem that was written in the first century BC. And the myth, as you would have heard it, was fully laid out not by a Greek, but by a Roman poet called Virgil. It seems then that the Greeks of the classical period were aware of the myth, but we don't have a great deal of comment about it until much later. Sat alongside these, Odysseus's catabasis seems lacking. By its own definition, the word catabasis means something like to travel down. And Odysseus doesn't exactly do that. He certainly journeys, but this is more to a liminal place where he then conducts that ritual, which is actually how he draws the dead to him. We don't have that same sense of a distinct journey to the underworld and interacting with what's there. And this has led to some debate as to whether it qualifies as a catabasis in the true sense, or at least in the ways that the others did. Given the nature of the cultural exchange in the Mediterranean, it won't surprise you that the notion of the catabasis wasn't anything unique to the Greeks. In Mesopotamia, there was the descent of Nana, which was recorded on a poem. This dated to the early 2nd millennium BC, so at least 1,000 or so years prior to the Iliad and the Odyssey. Despite the distance in time and geography, there are elements of it which seem quite familiar. Inanna was a Sumerian goddess, and she journeyed to visit her sister, the fantastically named Ereshkigal, Queen of the Dead. Even as a goddess, her trip wasn't easy. She was greeted at the gates of the underworld and proceeded through seven of them, and each she gave them an item of her clothing. When she arrived to meet her sister, she was judged and turned into a corpse. But Inanna wasn't naive, and had ensured that in such an event, her faithful servant would send two demons down to revive her with the water and the food of life. But even then, Inanna couldn't just return, and was required to have a substitute to take her place. And the choice was her husband, Demuzi. This might sound unusual, except Demuzi didn't conduct himself too well when news got out that Inanna had been kept hostage. He'd actually celebrated. But even he had insurance in the form of Gesh Tinana, his sister. And the two rotated their commitment to the underworld, each spending six months there. An underlying theme to this myth was the separation of the underworld and that of the living. There are those gates, the fact that even a goddess wasn't safe to make the journey, and the need for balance, that is to say, you don't get to leave without having someone replace you. This was further underlined in sinister tones by a later version of the myth, written in the period 900 to 600 BC. At one of the gates, Inanna becomes increasingly frustrated by being kept waiting and threatens to tear the gates down and raise up the dead who will eat the living. Finally, there's Nurgle and Eresh Kigal. Like the descent of Inanna or Ishtar, there's an earlier myth dating to around the 15th century BC, and a later one in the 7th century BC. In this, Nurgle seeks to conquer Eresh Kigal and become king of the underworld. This task is a challenge in itself, but also contains the theme of tests, something we've heard of in other myths I've already spoken about. In this instance, it's something which sounds familiar, the avoidance of eating or drinking anything in the underworld. Perhaps this wasn't that difficult. The food is described there as akin to dust, and the beer described as muddy water. Though there are lines missing in the poem, we know that the two ruled together eventually, but only after a struggle. There are some similarities here with the myth concerning Persephone and Hades, this too involved a physical struggle, the pursuit of marriage and food as a possible trap or a way of keeping someone there. This isn't the only time that a link or parallel with the cultures outside of Greece can be noted. I started this episode with Odysseus, and I'm going to focus on the rite he performed. This was to contact the dead, and such a rite was known as Nekia. What's of particular interest was that trench, which was dug and combined with the offerings within it, attracted the spirits of the dead. Pit rituals, including those which were made to consult the future and the spirits of the dead, were a practice the Hittites took really seriously. The Hittites were a people based in the centre of modern-day Turkey, and who had their heyday in the mid to late 2nd millennium BC. This practice may have spread elsewhere, though, because in the 8th century BC, there's a tablet detailing a story involving Gilgamesh. Here, a pit featured as a way that he communicated with his deceased friend Engadu. Both the Iliad and Odyssey have been sifted for instances which may reflect older customs, and may not have been fully realised at the time. For example, the sacrifice of the Trojan youths by Achilles at the funeral of Patroclus. That was certainly not contemporary Greek custom, but pointed to an earlier practice which had been abandoned by the time of Homer. So it's possible that the pit ritual was one practised by the Greeks, or just being referenced as something which was once done by another people. It goes to show 
just how important these poems were in housing what were at the time of composition older and perhaps almost forgotten practices. Moving back to classical Greece, Plato proposed a mini chronology relating to an aspect of the underworld which I've mentioned, judgment. Just to recap, what we've previously had is two main names involved as judges, Minos and his brother Radamanthus. In his play The Frogs, Aristophanes featured a third, Aeacus. In his work Gorgias, Plato outlined how the three worked and also how they came to be employed as judges in the first place. According to Plato, there had already been an existing process of judgment in which judgment was handed down to humans on their last day of life. However, Hades pointed out that this system had a flaw, that the judges were easily duped by the appearance of those they were judging and that the soul of the person wasn't as easy to assess. It might also be that those judged were able to prepare for their judgment in some way. After all, they had notification. The implication, though, is that proper judgment wasn't an outcome. It wasn't an effective process. The solution was to remove two aspects. The first of any notification of your death, so you were judged now after you died, and therefore you didn't have any prior notification or could prepare for it. The second removal related to your clothing, and this included the judges. Now you'd be judged naked by naked judges. Presumably this prevented anyone gaining an advantage from their appearance, and Plato underlined that this also allowed the soul to be examined more clearly. Two judges, Aeacus and Radamanthus, did the initial judging, with Minos as a sort of supervisor. Plato featured the dead and the afterlife in a number of his works, the notable in this context being the Phaedo, Gorgias and the Republic. As you might expect, this got very technical at points, and though I've avoided the topic of the soul, it's in the classical period where the concept of the soul is more heavily investigated and considered. For Plato, the issue of judgment and what happened to the soul wasn't boiled down to simply a good or bad outcome. He adds layers of bureaucracy. A soul might have led an okay life or committed minor crimes, in which case they were required to go through a purification process in the case of the former, or face temporary and punishment in the case of the latter. The truly egregious go straight to Tartarus, and likewise, those who've lived incredibly well go immediately to the nicer places. Added to the eschatological was the geographical. Plato described a complex layout of streams and rivers, such as the Acheron and Styx. This included the Lethe, where the dead would drink and thus forget their previous lives. Both Homer and Hesiod had also described, or gone some way to describe, the network of rivers. And this goes back to the point I mentioned earlier as to how water was really important. Perhaps here it's because it was a boundary. These rivers marked out sections of the underworld and I suppose carried over this function from the land of the living. They also had their own functions as well though. And on that point, it's important to veer away from the idea that the underworld was a subterranean place. The descriptions we have from Plato and other sources is that it was a place within itself with meadows, rivers and regions. Tartarus seems to have been a lower part within it, and the nicer locations such as the Elysian Fields and the Islands of the Blessed described in glowing terms. Curiously, Pindar even described the Islands of the Blessed in a victory ode dated to 476 BC and commented on the playful winds there. Though you might have travelled down to the underworld, it was a land unto itself. In direct contrast to the serious nature of the soul and the faraway underworld was a festival I want to finish on. One of the reasons I love the subject of ancient history is that you can have Plato and the drier discussions but also find the slightly bizarre and more fun. In spring, the Athenians celebrated the Anthesteria. This was a three-day festival in honour of Dionysus. Primarily, it was focused on the stored wine, which was opened and drunk. Each day had its own name. The first day was the jar opening, the second the pouring, and the third was called the pots. You can probably guess what went on from the names of the first and second day. The third, though, named Kytroi, the pots, was named after the small pots of food left out, but not for humans. These were left out for the spirits of the dead, and also as an offering to Hermes. The expectation, you see, was that the dead were allowed to join in with the festivities, and on the last day the focus was on Hermes, guiding them back to the underworld. One of my favourite vase images is found on a lekythos, a small type of vase often found in or around graves. On this, Hermes is shown with his wand and gesturing at some small figures which are flying around, and these have been suggested as spirits. 
central to the action and below the flying spirits is a large jar of wine. Perhaps Hermes is asking the spirits to form an orderly queue, or perhaps he's indicated that they've had enough and it's time to move on. Sadly, Plato never got round to addressing the important question, do spirits get hangovers? And on that note, I hope you enjoyed another Night of the Livy Dead offering. One day, I'll get that trending. And more importantly, I hope you have a great time doing whatever you are doing for Halloween. Just enjoy yourself. You deserve it. As ever, if you can leave a review or give me feedback, I'm here and I'm listening. But till next time, keep safe and stay well.